Welcome to the AI Chat Podcast. I'm your host, Jaden Schaefer. In today's episode, we are honored to have Masood Ali Baksh, a tech industry veteran and founder of NewSoft. He has a career spanning from software engineering for financial systems to consulting for companies like Microsoft and IBM. And Masood is a multifaceted innovator. He was the driving force behind New MD, which is a pioneering cloud-based medical management system, which was acquired by a Fortune 500 company in 2018. Currently, Masood is working on revolutionizing human and machine communication through his latest venture, which is Amadeus. Thank you so much for coming on the show. Thank you for having me, Yen, and thanks for that uh, intro. Talk to us a little bit about what it is that Amadeus does um, and and why you believe perhaps today with AI is a shift that um, is going to help propel that forward. Yes, this is um, this is uh, something that I I feel like I dis- I discovered it um, back in uh, I guess to uh, 2017. I'd been thinking about about it and working on it, and as as I was explaining and, and building these tools and trying to optimize communication between all the people that were the, within the, the company, um, I discovered uh, that there is a way by studying actually software in itself. Software itself is a communication tool, uh, typical software, any software that uh, you buy from Salesforce or IBM. And most of the uh, um, communication is done with within every company through these uh, software packages that take data in a structured fashion and communicate from one person to another. And that's really the majority of uh, of the automation we used in all these companies, just like we did, like uh, we took Jira and, and Asana and Trello and, and Slack, and these are all software. But although Slack actually is a, is a different kind of software, and then the reason why Slack or email found its way into the corporations was really that the the lack of or inability of, of traditional software that communicates uh, information in structured fashion. Have you ever wanted to start your own podcast? I record and publish podcasts on a platform called Spotify for Podcasters, and I absolutely love it. Essentially, you can upload from your phone or computer, and it distributes to every platform that plays podcasts. They support video podcasts, and you can make money on the platform with ads or even podcast subscriptions, something that has made my life so much easier as a podcaster. So if you're interested, I highly recommend you give it a try. You can download the Spotify for Podcast app or go to spotify.com slash podcasters to get started on your podcast today. Uh, and that leaves a lot of holes and because humans communicate with natural language and natural mm-hmm. language can, can cover a lot of subtleties in communication. So that the email and, and Slack and these tools found their way in the corporate world to really fill the gap or the uh, inability of traditional automation uh, in these organizations that, that that fail short in communicating the complete picture of information, so they came in to complement complement that uh, those tools, but they really created their own problems. They were they 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 were promised to be panaceas, and they ended up being Pandora's boxes. And okay. studying all of that uh, kind of led me to towards this model that I discovered, and based on that, we invented uh, uh, lots of interesting technology. Uh, and I essentially discovered that there is a way of uh, totally optimizing communication amongst people, but that you can't start with the communication itself. You can't start with the message or the messenger. You have to actually start with the workflow and okay. look at what's going on on the workflow. So that's all, you know, I wrote a paper on that in, in 2022 and it was published by uh, IEEE. And that's, I've got a little video we, we put out that kind of covers all that and I'll make that available for you if uh, you, you want to share with your audience. I think it's, yeah. I recommend everyone to watch it because it gives uh, a good insight into why email doesn't work. Why doesn't, uh, why do we have such so many problems with email? I mean, why doesn't it yeah. scare? Or even the, what they call the social, uh, the, the um, social media network for uh, enterprise at Slacks and Yammers and Teams, and why don't they work? Well, I mean, they solve some of the email problems, but why Why are they still not perfect? Why do they fall apart? And and that's because they are trying to map a very complex, multidimensional uh, model we call workflow. And workflow is really an abstraction of assembly line. And uh, we, we inherited that, uh, we abstracted that since the early 1900s. And this is how we, as large groups of people, 
uh, can get together 500, 5,000 uh, or 50 and organize ourselves and build products or deliver services. And, and that's the magic of how uh, humans are, are connected together. And that's where the secret is. Secret lies in, in, in making that uh, the pivot of communication. Yeah. And, and let me let me take a stab at explaining this concept. I'll drop a link to that video that you mentioned in the description for this for people. But let me take a stab at explaining that concept. You you let me know where I fall short, and then uh, let's talk a little bit about how you are using this to solve uh, problems with your comp with uh, Amadeus. And how how it, yeah. So and how it all ties to AI because yeah. that's really the the whole yeah. Okay. Yeah. So essentially, um, you know, everyone knows emails have a big problem when you have, you know, a thousand people in your organization and you send an email out to everyone. There's a ton of people that it's the email's not relevant. You've been in organizations like this. Everyone's been in organizations like this, right? You get an email about a specific project. You're not really relevant. You're not a decision maker. The information is irrelevant to you, but you just get a ton of like this kind of noise in your inbox. So we upgraded a little bit to the concept of Slack, where essentially you have channels or, you know, Microsoft Teams. Um, you have different channels, you got the marketing channel, you have um, the HR channel, you have a bunch of different channels, and perhaps you're relevant to that organization. So you're in the channel. Again, the same problem as you scale up to bigger organization, a lot of people can be messaging in that channel. Um, and there's a lot of noise that may not be relevant to you. Email doesn't scale is because if you if the pivot of uh, that communication model is the individual. So that means the individual is responsible for analyzing the information and figuring out who to route it. Now, mm -hmm. if, you, if you start scaling the number of these people from three to five to 10, 50, now each individual needs to have a very complicated routing map in their table, in their head, uh, a routing table in their head, and be able to analyze the information and figure out who to route it to. I was, that, that's a really too much task to, uh, to ask any. You know, as it goes beyond four or five, now, you know, you got a mess. That's easy to see, mm -hmm. right? And then in the social media model, which is like Slack and the, the and, and Yammer and some of these tools, that pivot shifts from the individual to the subject. Instead of saying, you know, instead of creating, a, you know, send me sending the information and email to, to you, uh, we'll just create a channel called paint or create a channel called nailing the chair or, you know, that. So I, I put information, I can now analyze that information as a human. And instead of trying to figure out who to send it to, I'll look at the content of that in information and say, well, that's basically paint content. I, I put, so the assumption is that they, the mapping is easier. Okay. So that's the abstract model. But the problem is that you're building uh, chairs, lots of chairs. <laughs> you're making thousands of chairs. It's moving on the assembly line, right? You may be interested, in, a salesperson may be interested in a particular chair that's a red chair. He doesn't care about any of these chairs, but he has to subscribe to that channel that says paint. Now he's going to get a lot of bombarding messages for the better next yeah. So that's for that example, I can kind of the, the, in, show why, why these things fail. Now, not everybody even, uh, you know, it's like in these models, when you, who creates these channels? How do you name them? Like it just becomes channels galore. Anybody who's ever used these systems, they know what happens as you add more individuals and more subject. And that's because this is this stuff is really not thought through or, or analyzed to, uh, in an abstract form. These tools found their way in an evolutionary process into these corporate settings because uh, Facebook was extremely successful and people asked, you know, hey, one individual can communicate with thousands of people in a nice way and we can't do this with email. Why can't we have a Facebook thing for our company? And that actually drove a lot of companies that to, with opportunities to try to build these tools. And, you know, and Yammer was one of the first successful ones and then Slack became successful. And you got a lot of tools that are similar to this. But they ended up not really solving the corporate problem. And in fact, they really exacerbated. In many, many interesting ways, because now you have corporate data sitting in all those databases that are the they're being input by the automation and software that the the is the main nervous system of the corporation. And then you have information sitting in emails that that is really the natural language, and some of that information is even duplicate. That's because you're extracting things from the database reports, you're attaching them, so. And then you have some of that information sitting in silos of Slacks and Yammers and Microsoft. Now, so the corporate data is scattered all over the place. Okay, so that's the face of the problem that uh, for me as an engineer, I get very excited about because we want to solve these problems. And mm -hmm. this problem is prevalent all throughout uh, the corporate world, all around the world. And as we know now, fast forward, we get to where data is oil. 
why is data oil and or data is gold? Data, uh, why? Because that's what you feed to AI. Okay, so in order to 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 create uh, some sort of uh, meaningful uh, intelligence or output from uh, uh, or work from an artificial intelligence engine, you need to feed it data. But your data is scattered all over the place, and that this is what what the uh, what the the success. Uh, of ChatGPT that demonstrated the power of large language models. Uh, now a lot of uh, corporate CEOs are asking the following questions: How do I? How do we get AI into our company, and how do we actually benefit from this, and how do we use it to create efficiencies? This episode is brought to you by Shopify. That's the sound of switching your business to Shopify, the global commerce platform that supercharges your selling. Harness the best converting checkout and same intuitive features, trusted apps, and powerful analytics used by the world's leading brands. Stop leaving sales on the table. Discover why millions trust Shopify to build, grow, and run their business. Sign up today for your $1 per month trial period at shopify.com slash tech23. Mm-hmm. That's really the, that's this is exactly where we are right now. We're in this space, yeah. And what 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 I what I see uh, on a daily basis, and it's almost becoming repetitive. And I'm sure most of your audiences would uh, uh, have similar experiences. That we're beginning to see repetition of the same stories because AI is being used as a tool, in a sense, and it's in their problems that are basically what I call low hanging fruit. And you could easily see the application of AI, whether it's a large language model where you take a manual and uh, feed it the, the the feed the AI the manual or the frequently asked questions, and then you use it as a better chat bot to answer questions uh, of your clients, or you summarize a legal document, or you fake somebody's voice, or all the wonderful things that you can do with Midjourney or um, Dolly. So there are a myriad of these tools that are uh, producing a lot of wonderful, wonderful uh, um, uh, results and also help with productivity or improving productivity. But they're all low-hanging fruit and they're all superficial. Because this way, from, from our perspective, that we're using AI as a tool where we think AI itself is a platform. Similar to the fact that graphical user interfaces back in the 1980s were a platform and a lot of software had to be rewritten or every software had to be rewritten. The software you use today is based on graphical user interface. It's based on that computational model. And that was a major revolution that happened in the 80s and the 90s. And a lot of software companies had to change their model of writing uh, their software that's continuing to this day. And the same, a different revolution happened in the 2000s, uh, and that was the transference from local area network computation to what we call cloud today, which is the the internet. It's a distributed model. It's a different kind of architecture. It's a completely different way of writing software. Uh, and the way we organize as engineers is different. We have DevOps, we have backend people, we have uh, front-end people. It's a complete reorganization of of uh, uh, human expertise, and the way we actually approach building the, the, these, these systems. Now, what, what we see is that we, we are entering a new revolution, and that is the artificial intelligence revolution. And we need a new, brand new architecture, brand new way of breaking those uh, business software into a new model that can take full advantage of the artificial intelligence. And we've invented one. And we call that object messaging and intelligent objects. And we feel that the major revolution and the major impact that the artificial intelligence, namely large language models, are going to have on human society is through this re-architecting all of our software for this new platform. And in that world, our software, and I'm going to explain why that is and what is our software what's the problem with the software that we're using today, whether that's your accounting system or your electronic medical record system, if you're a physician, or if you uh, project management systems, if you're an engineer or a project manager, any software that we use, it's outdated, outmoded. It needs to be broken up, thrown out, rewritten all over again for this new platform. 
So what would you say are the the major the major shifts as far as like this platform goes shifting from thinking of AI as a product to a platform? What do you think the, the biggest changes are going to have to be? Okay, so I'll, 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 I'll describe the story. See, they, when the computers showed up in the uh, work environment, in the corporate world, business, um, they showed up and they said, well, you know, we're, we're going to bring some cool automation to you. And let's say you were a big manager in a bank somewhere or a manufacturing facility or whatever. And I'd ask you, Yaden, what's your existing process and where do you keep your information? And you would kind of describe your process. This is what we do. I, you know, fill out this form and, you know, and Susie gives it to Jane and Jane gives it to David. They they fill out this section and it goes to the floor and they, so I would look at that and I take all the forms as a, uh, as a software engineer. And I would document that whole process flow and your physical process flow. And I'd draw it a, a, a flow diagram, a flow chart. And then I would extract a, typical a data flow diagram or a control flow diagram. These are all diagrams that actually get, I used to, I would be using to automate your process, your physical process, and take all your forms essentially and put them on the, on the screen on a computer. That's how, that's the, that's, that's, that's the model for, business process automation, basically, in a very uh, a simplified way. Essentially, I take your physical forms and I stick them on, on, on a screen, and then I take the data, which is structured data, you know, and then that data is very specific, like the name, Joe, size, 15, a date, uh, 11, whatever, right? It's like you can't put something else in, and that's very, very, strong. that's what's referred to as structured data. Um, and that would get pushed into a database, and then it's a lot faster. It's automated. It, it, it standardizes things. You don't have to fill things out on the form of the typewriter. Um, and it, the access is easier. Somebody doesn't need to put all these forms together and create a report for the high manager. You do this magical query, and, and whatever information you want, you kind of make real-time reports on somebody's screen. And this is what we've been living with since then that's the model even through graphical user interface revolution this model didn't change even though we changed the the way humans inter interact with the computer before they would just interact with text and just mm -hmm. read the questions they will answer the questions but now there are objects on the screen that you interact with you click on right so it opens up it tells you something uh and you move things you drag something you drop it somewhere else so that graphical user interface facilitated and, and, and made human and machine interaction easier, much, much easier, and made it less intimidating. And that was really uh, uh, coupled with the uh, 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 ba the introduction of uh, personal computers, they were called at the time, PCs. I don't know that they, 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 if we still refer to them at, at the, during the 80s. And so computers ended up being everywhere, but that model stayed the same. Take the forms, stick them on the screen. Even during the uh, transition to the internet, that model didn't change. The same forms on the screens, put them on the now on the screens that are uh, pushed through computers that you don't see somewhere in the cloud, right? Uh -huh, um, right. Now, now AI is here, and we've been waiting for this. We've been waiting for this because based on the model that we uh, created, we've been waiting for uh, a reliable way to be able to process natural language 100 percent reliably we see the problem has been so far that computers really didn't understand natural language okay and it did not in a reliable way if anything chat gbt can demonstrate is that now we can actually understand we can build machines that un understand humans 100 percent chat gbt for example is not all reliable when it's generating uh, uh answers and a lot of the uh, right. And the, the Google people coined that, uh, uh, they coined a phrase called hallucination. So it can hallucinate. But uh, even when it hallucinates, it still understands you perfectly. It makes stuff right. up, but that means that it just understood you. So right. we, take, we take that part of that technology that understands language, and we actually have designed a new approach of creating software. It's like beyond the whole taking all the uh, forms and then stick them, sticking them on the screen. We're saying no. Look, um, this is this is an intelligent machine, and we can actually re really remove the burden, a lot of the burden uh, that we would put on humans in terms of determining who to send information to, when to send it to, 
where to uh, store information and uh, which creating file folders, put things in this file folder, put it in that file, they're organizing the information. I mean, why do humans have to do this? And it's like, we've got a computer here. This computer, you can program it to play chess, for God's sake. You can't program it to file your data for you where you're supposed to be. But see, the, the point. Yeah, you know, it really is just think it's like, like, why should I uh, open up my, uh, turn on my phone, on, which is a computer, and look at there with 50,000 apps, figure, try to figure out which one to press. I mean, why can't I just talk to the darn thing and say, I'm hungry? Right. So just say, what do you feel like? I mean, if, if you, did you ever um, see, there was a movie actually it was called, I think it was called Her, um, that was uh, not too long ago where a new operating system comes in. And the only interface was a natural language. It's like uh, it's a it's it's a famous movie that the time was popular, but that's where we need to go to. We need to go where humans interact with the machine with using natural language, and graphical user interfaces are also good because there a lot of times you just point at something instead of using ten words, you can just point at something, right? So the combination of the screen and natural language uh, could probably make the ideal user interface but you need a different kind of uh, architecture to build this software and the way that architecture the way we we describe it is instead of just taking dumb forms and sticking them on the screen and then connecting them these forms together with automation and and, and putting the data in the database you need to go one step further as a, as a software engineer actually a few steps further you need to, in that environment, after you talk to Yed and then he describes to you the, 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 the process, is you need to go further and start doing the uh, semantic analysis and identify the real and virtual objects in that environment. And then you need to find a way of representing those objects uh, with programming and make those objects intelligent. There, there's a, a way of, of, of creating uh, data around the, that object in traditional forms to give it, uh, for example, I could kind of represent an X-ray, let's say an electronic right. record. Yeah. I could make an X-ray and represent that uh, uh, in, in as an object. I could tell it that it has attributes that you're an X-ray, the uh, technician who uh, took your picture was Masood on this date, so these are all structured data. But what we can do is actually this object, now we can give it a large language model. We can insert a large language model so, such that it can actually communicate with humans that x-ray object can communicate with humans using natural language. And then we add other pieces to this object. We give it uh, ways, that, like imagine like diary books. We'll give it a black diary such that it can record the communication between itself, the x-ray, and uh, the x-ray is responsible for recording that communication between the doctor, the primary doctor, and the patient. Then it will give it a green book to record all the conversations between the primary doctor and specialist than any other uh, uh, or nurses. So basically we make the object intelligent and self-aware and we give it the ability just like a human to process natural language so it can not only have dialogues with humans and understand what's happening, but it can also record information. For example, if, if the doctor needs to have a conference call with the patient, the object itself can hold that conversation and sit there and be present and watch that conversation and record the video and store the video within itself. No longer anybody has to say, well, I'm going to put this video file in this folder and I'm going to remember that it belongs to patient Masood, right? The object itself knows that it's an x-ray. It, uh, it's present and it's actually sitting there listening and it can sit and sit the, listen to the entire conversation between two specialists, the doctor and the specialist. And they're talking about the, whether this is cancerous, it's not cancerous. And the object, just like a, a human, can remember and understand. And in fact, it can even do better than the normal uh, traditional uh, LLMs because it doesn't have to search the entire space. It knows that it's an x-ray. So it can focus, actually. So the, the structured data that defines that object allows it to focus and have constraints about the way it processes that natural language. At the end of the call, it may be that uh, you and I are the doctors and we talk about, okay, now we say, how about golf this weekend? See, the object knows, okay, this is not related to me because now they're talking about golf. So this object becomes super intelligent about itself as to what happened to it 
and who, who the stakeholders are and how to keep track of those stakeholders. When critical information happens to itself, it knows how to navigate the workflow. It knows how long it has to stay in each stage. Uh, and it knows all the different classes of stakeholders, what kind of information to share with whom. So if you think of your system as a collection of all these intelligent objects, now, what does that remind you of? There are systems like that on planet Earth. They're biological systems, actually. Our, <laughs> a lot of biological systems are built in such a way where we have... Um, in, for example, in, in, a, in, in, in my body, in, in the back of my brain, there's not a little file folder that keeps track of uh, cell number 57 in my liver. Mm -hmm. That information is self-contained within the cell of my liver, and the liver cell knows exactly what it is. It's a fairly complex machine, and it knows its function. It has memory even. It knows how to communicate with its neighbors. It's intelligent and self-aware. And the collection of those cells create the liver. And the liver itself is an intelligent uh, super component that's connected to the rest of the system through veins and arteries and nervous systems. So we're actually adopting this model and taking it to silicon and saying, you can actually represent a business or manufacturing process and, and go beyond just the workflow process and the basic automation and identify these virtual or real objects and represent them in uh, in your program and add the LLM to them so they become intelligent so they can process all kinds of information and interact with humans and also each other because if they understand LLM, these objects can talk to each other in, in, in natural language as well. They can query each other because they all have memories. They can say, hey, the x-ray could query the blood uh, uh, test uh, object or the specific uh, object inside that blood test. The, the x-ray could uh, interact with the HDL or your uh, blood count, for example. If, um, I'm not a doctor. I don't know if that, that would make sense. But you can imagine relevant uh, objects that are basically as, as a software engineer, what you're doing, you're, you're creating this framework. All you have to do is create this framework and then you create objects and you give them life. And these objects can create super objects and these super objects can be connected systemically toward, uh, to each other. And they, you could even design a super, uh, super uh, uh, object that is a brain that's sitting mm -hmm. there, similar to our brain, that the brain is sitting there coordinating the uh, efforts and uh, communications at a higher level between the liver and the kidneys. And so it's a, a lot more complex than that as, 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 an, as, an, uh, as an analogy. The, the biology of humans is a lot more complex. As a matter of fact, uh, it's, it's a source of the in inspiration. But if you, and, and what, what we've done is actually we created this model, in which we call object messaging and intelligent objects. And this is a brand new model. And based on this model, what we did is we, we spent quite a number of years, uh, a few years trying to build a platform, actually, a okay. framework that, uh, but this was too, too complex. Uh, and a lot of engineering problems had not been uh, solved. You know, the, this was brand new territory. So we decided uh, after uh, almost uh, two years that we just pivot and build an application using this model so we can actually demonstrate to the world what this thing looks like, how it feels to interact with a system like this. So we had a problem back uh, when uh, in my last company when the, that I was just referring to trying to integrate Jira with the uh, Trello and, and Slack and uh, Google Docs and all these tools and writing software. So we decided right. let's solve that problem using this model. So as a result, we've created project management, collaboration, uh, communication, documentation, powered by AI in one package using this model. So I said from the moment you, you log into the system, at every point you're interacting with the AI. And you, you, it's implicit, it's sitting there. You can call it and you can interact with it. But uh, essentially, the system is a collection of all these objects that, that handle your project management. And these objects are intelligent. They know what they are. They know, for example, is there a feature or there a bug. They know well, if something happens to the, them. They know who to go to, who to complain to. If they sit too long in, in a particular stage, 
They'll uh, they, they look at their clock like they expired. They run around and tell their stakeholders, hey, you know, I was supposed to be here uh, 30 minutes, but I'm here now for uh, 35 minutes. And it gives a chance to interact with, with the appropriate stakeholders. It's a fascinating experience. It's really a, oh uh, a taste of the, the, next, uh, the next thing to come. So we I've... kind of demonstrated to ourselves that the, the, the how to build something intelligent um, on, on the yeah. machine. I feel like this is an entire paradigm shift for software and for project management and for so many things. This is such an interesting concept. Um, talk to me about like, what, what does this actually look like in practice? Like, so you're talking about, right, you have these different elements. Let, for some reason, when I'm thinking about this, all I can think about is like all of the, um, all of like the folders inside of like an organization, all the different departments that organize their projects by folders or by different things. So all of this has intelligence to all of them how like what what is the integration right like let's say i'm a, a regular corporation that uses um microsoft teams to organize and like pretty much the whole microsoft in like suite to do everything like is this an integration i can pull into my current system do we have to recreate new systems for something like this well what's what's this going to look like for your average you know uh enterprise i think um i'm pretty convinced that we're going to have to go through this tectonic shift the, the same way that we did the during the uh, graphical user interface revolution where we ended up having to rewrite all this software and as we did during the land to the internet where we ended up having to rewrite all of our software because the current model the way for example jira is written the way uh slack is just a tool it's basically really just uh, trying to solve uh, the problem of natural language and, and converging it with structured data. They're, it's like it's an evolutionary process that we're going to through. And we need a merger of all of this. We need the merger of email, Slack, and, and, and your uh, accounting system into one magical world, right? And you can't just fuse them together the way they're written. So the, architecturally, they, they have to be rewritten from scratch. So... And so because we do need communication from one to one in person to person, and, and actually the channel communications are also interesting, but they're not sufficient for uh, representing workflow-based communication. Channels are good rep digital representations of departments and groups, and that's it. Okay. Uh, but you know, for, for our structured software is what we need to do is we need to rewrite all the existing software like accounting or practice management systems or electronic medical records and really merge all this stuff together. Um, I, I, I'm afraid there's no other way around it. If we're going to meaningfully, deeply integrate AI into our software, okay, we need to actually break all this stuff up and start reconstructing our software using intelligent objects. And these intelligent objects, because they carry information and you have human nodes that are interacting with these intelligent objects, and these human nodes are different classes of stakeholders that have something to do with the system. They have expertise that they want to give to the system. And there's information that they need from the system at the right time and right, uh, right information. So if you rebuild these systems with intelligent objects, and these objects figure out how to transmit themselves, the whole object can transmit itself. The x-ray, when, when you are the doctor and the x-ray is taken by... Uh, by the technician. The x-ray knows it's an x-ray and it knows it's right. a chest x-ray and because it's designed that way and it knows it's authorized. The minute it was taken, there's a model that's been, it's an uh, authorized model within the system that is held somewhere in Mayo Clinic and that has it, the address. The x-ray has the address. It flies over there, bounces against that x-ray model, gets a full report, and reads it and starts seeing, oh, there are areas of concern here and there. And all of a sudden, that object flies right into Dr. Yedin's inbox and says, hey, I'm here. I look like I have some problems here. You need to really look at me. And then you basically open up that x-ray and you can query it. You could talk to it. You could, uh, uh, okay. Yeah. So fascinating framework. But then it, it, I think a lot of people, it begs the question a lot of people are going to have, which is like, is this a terrifying dystopian reality where, you know, essentially every object is a smart object interacting with itself independent of us? Um, you know, 
Is this like the Terminator situation, right? No, well, <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, I, 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 I guess. And not in this phase anyhow, because what's going to happen in this phase, just think about it, just the act of the, the, the x-ray technician knows how to take x-rays. Like, bang, you just do the x-ray. So why should he go over there and now drag that x-ray, drop it into a folder, type somebody's name and shoot that message to to, to that person? And why? That's like, why, do you, why should he be responsible for routing that x-ray message? And when the x-ray shows up somewhere, right? Then they have to look at it and go, well, we know this uh, Mayo Clinic has this model. So let's just uh, send an email there and, and a secure email, attach this, send it over there and wait uh, two hours or whatever for that x-ray to be read. And then they'll send you an attachment uh, document and the, and the doctor gets a chance to read all this stuff, right? Just think about, oh, this is all information management, right? As opposed to where with technology today, today. Because now we have an LLM who understands that they can understand perfectly natural language. You could build a system that when the minute the x-ray is taken by the technician, all he does is says, you know, basically brings up the patient on the, on the machine. And that, by the way, that patient object is also an intelligent object. Imagine this, all the system is written like that. And just clicks on uh, and, and somewhere and points the camera, the x-ray, takes the picture, and he's done. That x-ray now is, is aware. I'm an x-ray. I belong to patient Masood. Okay. All right. Well, the, I'm XA of this type. Okay. So, but next my, and I know my more, my workflow because I've been programmed with workflow. I have to now examine myself through this process. Next is, okay, hit yourself against this model, wherever that model is. Boom. Hit yourself against that model. Wait for it to get an output. Where does that output go? It doesn't go into some folder. It goes into me. I hold all this stuff. I am that intelligent object. I keep all my information. I handle all this information. Don't worry about it. I know where to put them. I know which one is more. I'll create my own folders. I'll share them with you whenever you need it. If you want to look at that whole document, I'll give it. Oh, what would you like to know? You would like to see, because I just read the report and I've got these alerts here and I've highlighted myself with graphical stuff on the screen. I want you, you know, doc, please look at these areas. They could be potentially cancerous or whatever the, the problem may be with it. But, oh, you would you like to see the full report? Here's a full Read it from something. Two things that I think are incredibly valuable here. Uh, number one is, I think a lot of the times um, when you're trying to get information, one of the big challenges is asking the right question. You see this with ChatGPT or anything else. Some people might ask it a question, think the output is garbage, but if you just had asked it like more specifics and and more in a better way, you'd get a better output. I think this is a really interesting concept where essentially, uh, especially when you mentioned like the alerts there let's say you have a x-ray and it can tell you like, hey, look, I've looked at all these things. These are the things you need to be aware of. Perhaps a technician or someone um, is looking at some areas, but they, they don't understand like once they could be blindsided by a specific issue. They didn't see it coming, whatever. And if this object was able to get a broad view of information and perhaps pick up on something that you missed, um, that could be very valuable. That's one area I think this is incredibly interesting. Another is the concept of like, building software. So I have a background in building um, software. I have, uh, I started a company called self pause. It's the number one AI life coach um, and been working on that for, for many years. Um, but what's really an interesting concept to me is if you had a software product, any kind of software product, and the whole thing was intelligent at its base, where essentially it was constantly learning about ways to self optimize and Oh, I have a bug. Report the bug. Oh, here's the issue. Maybe here's the code to fix the bug. Here's the the number one feature people are requesting. Like that, it could be just that's an incredible uh, paradigm shift where essentially your software self improves. Um, again, though, one thing I do want to ask you about is you mentioned earlier the concept of a brain. So having you you got like the brain on the system that's kind of helping to orchestrate things. Like, what is that brain? Is that brain open? Like, for example, is it like OpenAI's ChatGPT model, um, or is that something different? You know, get what I'm saying? Like, it's something, yeah. Think it's, no, it's, it's something different. So, uh, the the two two things to do in, envision. In, it, um, if you can envision your system, whatever you're trying to automate, as a collection of intelligent objects. And it could be different. I mean, it, 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 for example, we, we've got this project management, collaboration, communication, documentation, and it has to be all that, by the way. It's a, it's a, there's a reason why they have to be integrated because when you create the, like, so in our system, 
we basically said, okay, the, the smallest object, you know, is, is we call it a nugget. We gave it a cute name because nugget is a, a gold piece of information. So the nugget, a, a collection of nuggets, you could put them all together and make a sprint. And then you put 10 sprints together and that's your project or 50 sprints. So you got objects that are nuggets, they become super components that, that are sprints instead of the collection of super components are projects. And when you create, anybody can create this nugget. And you just give it a definition. It says, you know, say it's a bug. You want to report a bug. Or you want a feature. You say, hey, I want a feature that, you know, is a user. You could be a salesperson. You could be anybody. And that, the minute you create that, that object knows where to go. It's like, oh, it belongs to this project. It just flies and finds the project manager and just flies into the appropriate inbox as a triage. And says, hey, you know, I need attention. You know, it's like, it's like somebody create. And they can examine it. They can actually talk to uh, that object. They can use that, open up that object because the object transferred itself. It's the object messaging. The object is the message. And that object is intelligent. It's like it could hold all the conversation. So the project manager can start holding a conversation in there inside the object with the creator. And there could be other stakeholders. You know, other people found that object in, because they were looking for those features and they find it just like a Google search and they start following it. So they become stakeholders. And that object knows all these stakeholders. And the communication is, is held inside the, the, its own communication channel because it holds it. So you don't have to keep track of where you could go in there and attach an Excel file in there, but it holds it. You can read it. You could attach a file or a link to that feature saying, hey, I've seen something similar on the internet. By the way, here's a link to that. And, and the object keeps track of that. So the object is the document manager, the whole thing. Mm -hmm. The object is the, is the collaborator that's the arbiter of collaboration between all these people. Right, so there it becomes that, and it's intelligent enough because it's sitting there and it doesn't need to generate any text. So it doesn't have to hallucinate because all it has to do is read the information about itself, right? It says, okay, it's, like that, it's not like it's going to go read the whole internet and you got to ask it some crazy question and it just makes stuff up. It's, it knows that it's a, it's a feature that is a button of this size and it's the, when you press it, something happens. Here's the action. It knows all that. And it understands the conversations between the stakeholders, but it also knows the, the workflow. So if it's assigned to a programmer and the programmer says, you know, I'm going to start this coding this on Wednesday, Thursday comes up, the object wakes up, says, you know, nobody did any work on me. They didn't report anything on me. So I assume they didn't do any work. I'm going to show up and I actually calculate how fast this guy is. It doesn't look like he's going to be able to finish me by Friday based on the, everything that I see. And it actually knows a lot of information about you. And I won't get into how, because if you're constantly working on these things, it, you know, the whole system, the brain gets an idea about how good is uh, Gideon in, uh, estimating? Because he constantly, about 23 percentile, he overestimates, uh, he's too optimistic about his, 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 his hours, right? He's always off about 27%. So the, the, the brain actually learns and the object has access to that information. So it figures out, no. Yaden is not going to be, he said to the project manager, I'm going to finish me Friday. Okay. It, I don't think so. So it flies all the way through and goes into the inbox of the uh, project manager. And that particular inbox is called bad news. Just like, you know, your, your, your Gmail, the way everything is sorted out, like messages. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Interesting enough, when you go to object messaging and intelligent objects, your interface, the interface to your system becomes streamlined. All the interfaces for all systems are going to look like messaging system, like Gmail. And it just makes sense. And actually, this was very surprising to us because, we, you know, I'm, this is another segue I could take into uh, the approach to design. You know, I'm actually, I'm, I'm, I'm not one of those people who, um, we, we, we believe in designing using, in the beginning, you don't worry about user interface and user experience. You start solving what we call plumbing problem. Just start mm -hmm. with the plumbing. Make sure your plumbing is co is coherent. You, you have minimum number of rules. Your grammar is very, very small. And so you come up with then You have compatibility with the way you build your objects and your databases. This is a very interesting approach. And allow the user interface to, to emerge. So to be free with that. And then mm -hmm. we, we, we adapt. And, and then we, we don't actually start with user stories. We make user stories. But we, we, we validate our systems with user stories at the tail end. Like, you know, it's like because you don't want to start with, you know, that's a top bottom approach. We have a yeah. bottom to top approach. And, I, and, I, and I, that's a whole different subject. But our, our system started looking like a messaging system. And we said, duh, object messaging, of course. And that's going to streamline. 
And we made a lot of interesting discoveries because it's moving towards where once you have a system like that, essentially you can actually hook up a microphone to it and you don't have to train anybody about anything. You just go in front of the system saying, show me all my projects. And it just knows that it it knows the navigation to that system because it's built like a, a very simple tree structure, like a messaging. It just goes to the right module, pulls, it shows you all the right projects. And you look at it and go, well, why is that one delayed? You know, the third one, get into that one. And you just talk to it and get, to, and nobody ever trained you. So we're getting very, very close with this model towards that universal interface as well, where the, the main interface between the, the machine and the human is natural language and, and visual elements are pointing at this. So we you know there's a brave new world that's, that's waiting, but in this phase, it's not going to turn into the Terminator. I have to disappoint you with that. Okay. What do you think, you, you talked a lot about the fact that this is like a total, conceptually, I mean, this is kind of a total rewrite uh, ground up for a lot of software and other things. What do you think the biggest challenge you will face, companies will face in implementing a vision like this? Like, what's the biggest pushback? What's the hardest part of actually making this a reality? Yeah, well, you put your, you put your fingers on it. It's uh, the big corporations are going to be late in just like you know, the big companies are going to be late in adopting this model, but the, this is a force of nature. It's a, it's a tsunami that's about to come. We're going to have to, if we're going to create efficiencies in a meaningful way and be able to use AI for what is really, really valuable in our society. I mean, we impact our society via these organelles that we call corporations and companies. Okay, so, you know, Of course, we go out and play together and then eat together and do all kinds of fun things together as humans, but the way we impact the planet even, is through these uh, machines we we would be called corporations. And I mean, I, I the, gave a talk and I uh, used this example. It's like, you know, you drive through any Western city. You look up, you know, all these beautiful, shiny buildings, 50, 100 floors, full of educated people uh, with master's degrees, PhDs in different background, bachelor's degrees, finance, uh, medical, all kinds of stuff. Can you imagine chat GPT as an engineer, since you've got engineering back? Can you imagine ChatGPT eating all their jobs uh, as, as the Sam Altman predicts uh, the white collar jobs are going to go away? And if, if you can imagine it, fine. That's almost like science fiction. But as an engineer, how? I mean, I'm an engineer. You're in, you, you, you've got a, a software background on, uh, and probably an engineer because if you're into software, you're an engineer. Uh, can you imagine the steps that are required for that? That's the question. And this is what the, what we're talking about, object messaging and intelligent objects. That actually describes step-by-step step how to do that. You point out, and in fact, we're not going to replace these jobs. What we're going to do, we're going to make them efficient. We're going to remove the burden of information exchange and information storage and information management from humans and give that back to the machine. Humans need to be human experts at their jobs. They know, they have the wisdom, they have the decision-making. We are basically uh, making them extremely inefficient by forcing or burdening them to create, the once the information is created, to organize it, sort it, put it in the right place, route it to the right person at the right time. And 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 these systems, if you imagine the nervous systems of, of these corporations being the software that's really connecting all these humans together, now, that's, that's the structured software. That's the form-based software. And then you have then email, and then you have these silos of these channels, information scattered, all those. The, these, these machines cannot be efficient. Imagine a, an amazing merger of all these different systems together where objects are intelligent and they're taking care of information exchange at the right time, right place, to the right person, and showing up in front of you saying, hey, Yaden, this is what's the matter with me, and you need, I need attention. And you can tell me to go away and go away, or you can ask me questions. Any question you want, I can I can answer you. Uh, the extra can show up and say, I don't even know you. I don't remember you as an X-ray. So it's Dr. Schaefer, you don't remember me? I, I two months ago you had a conference call with Dr. Alabash about me, and you said this. Would you like to see that? I can bring that out of my memory my memory, these seven seconds. Here it is. I'll play it for you. That's actually accessing the video that happened and it's stored it, right? Now it's part of its memory. That now this is self-awareness. Now information is residing where it needs to be residing. It's with that object. 
You don't need to file it in some folder according to your uh, way of thinking. And Susie needs to do the same thing. And we have all this duplicate information. It 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 is if you, you at one point when when that stuff happens to a normal brain, it becomes diseased. We come up with uh, the way it's calling it different things. You know, dementia. And and, yeah. and and at a very core level, if you take a neural net, and if, when you start a neural net. And these are a bunch of cells that are uh, organized together hierarchically, and you kind of connect the lower layers to the higher layers and higher layers, and so on and so forth, and you uh, assign random links to these to these uh, to these connections. In the beginning, it's it's not very intelligent. It's actually uh, that can't do anything useful. Uh, let's say you want to train this neural network to detect a cat in a photo, so you get good statistical sample of. Cat photos, because uh, you can't get all the cat photos in the world, and you come up with all kinds of fancy algorithms and you train. Once it becomes smart, you show it a picture with two whiskers. It says, hey, there's a cat right in the corner. It's better than even a human, right? <laughs> if it's right. trained. You open up this box to see, where is this intelligence? Where did this go? You see, actually, the links changed. The way you started, it's like, oh, now they all this one just completely disappeared. That link right there just fires 20% of the time intelligence amongst these cells, because the cells are the same cells, intelligence for performing a particular function, detecting a cat amongst a bunch of cells is in the way they communicate in an optimized manner. Information is transmitted from the right cell to the right cell at the right time. If you take human beings in a organization and apply the same analogy and say humans, assume the humans are the cells in, in, in this body. And if you can find a way of guaranteeing that the right message goes to the right person at the right time, which is an optimized model of communication, you have created maximum collective intelligence. And this is going to create unbelievable efficiencies and unbelievable earnings. These companies, most any company that adopts these models, their efficiency is going to go through the roof and humans are going to be happiest. What do you think the the capex for like instituting one of these systems would be? Like, I mean, when we're talking about like earnings going through the roof, let's say you're a publicly traded company, you're like, I'm not going to be one of the slow guys. I mean, we have a bunch of Fortune 500 company listeners on the that, that listen to this podcast. They want to they want to implement a, a system like this. What are they going to have to spend in order to implement something like this? Uh, and yeah, and, and what, is, what does that look like? Well, my recommendation to them is if they have got any software project that are developing right now, they need to stop and they need to start thinking in this direction. They need to retrain their uh, um, the software engineers and the designers. And it's not that complex, actually, to be honest. Uh, but uh, we actually hold seminars. We do webinars uh, online and uh, we're uh, doing free webinars and discussing this model and we go... Uh, through one product we've created, which is this project management tool. And we also uh, give a free trial of, of this such that they can manage a small project and experience it firsthand. Because once you experience it, you're not going to go back. Once you experience it, you realize this amazing tectonic shift. It's, it's a completely different world. Now you're dealing with an intelligent software. Because when you logged in, you're dialing anywhere you are. Imagine there's a chat GPT is there and it knows where you are, who you are, what you're doing, what your action is. And in fact, uh, the, 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 it, you can, it, it can collaborate with you. And is this something that small businesses as well can take advantage of, right? Like let's say we have a couple of small software companies listening to this. They got five or six employees. They don't want to miss out on this next wave. Well, what advice would you give to them? I would say this is your golden opportunity. I mean, they, every company that you know today in technology, they were born during the dot-com days, every major company or past that. And they took advantage of this shift from local area networks to the internet. In many ways, even Google took advantage of that. I mean, if we were still on sitting on local area networks, there would be no search engine, no Google, right? It's a, um, I mean, the, the look at Amazon. Uh, it's an application that's running on the cloud, basically. I had uh, Salesforce, for example, the, the, they were created. And actually, I was one of the first customers in the, the, back in the dot-com days. They were giving it away for free 
they took advantage of this shift from local area networks. So they built a CRM for this new uh, platform and now they're a monster company. So I would say they're in luck. This is your golden, golden time. And any entrepreneur, software engineer that's thinking about some cute little tool they want to build or some little application, build it using object messaging and intelligent object. We call it OMU for short. Incredible. Okay, Masood, thank you so much. I know we got to wrap up the show today. Thank you so much for coming on and sharing this incredible concept. Um, so much, my personally, that I have to digest and start rethinking about some of the things I'm working on. Um, and I'm sure a lot of people are like that. If people want to be able to reach out to you, ask you more questions, test out your platform, what's the best way for people to to find you and your platform? Okay, so the the uh, product is called Omadeus, O M A D E U S, and uh, um, and O M actually sa- stands for object messaging, um, and www.omadeus.com. They can go on there and read the information. And we also make available the two papers that were published by IEEE. Just the, the, the recent one was published a, a few months ago. And actually, we were awarded the, the innovation uh, of the year by the computer science, computer engineering uh, of, over this invention. Uh, and they can register for web, uh, a webinar and they can uh, uh, read the papers. And we've got some uh, instructive videos. We've got a lot of uh, uh, Q&A stuff that explains uh, more further uh, in, in how AI is related to this. So the, if you're a software company or technology company, sign up for a webinar. If you uh, want to try out the software, just sign up. There's a place where you can do a free trial on, on the website. And, uh, and um, we're very excited by this. I think the, the future is extremely exciting. And, and, and there are going to be a lot of new companies uh, being born through this revolution. Incredible. Well, I'm super excited. I'll have to check that out as well. I'll leave uh, links in the description for the listeners. Thank you again, Masood, so much for coming on the show and and sharing all this. Um, For the listeners, thanks so much for tuning into the AI Chat Podcast. Make sure to rate us wherever you get your podcasts and have an amazing rest of your day.